What are we commemorating today? Yeah. So yesterday was really a bad day. And we read through the, the uh, account in the Desire of Ages. And um, you know, that was a rough day. It was a rough day for heaven. And um, today he slept in the grave. But um, still, it was a time in the universe when Christ wasn't doing his work. So, quite the day. Now, tomorrow's the most glorious Sunday coming. But probably not the most glorious day in the future. And that's what we're going to talk about today in our lesson study, is Christ's second coming and just some of the implications with that. So with that, um, any praises or prayer requests? Praises or prayer requests? Remember all the people that have been invited by these meetings. Okay. We called and reminded some that, <laughs> yes. Hey, the meetings are, are you still coming? Oh, yeah, we're coming. So, anyway. Any other prayer requests? Are they? Okay. Okay. Fantastic. Yeah. Not, not things could go haywire, huh? Yeah. For me, computer stuff never goes haywire. Right, Rick? Right. Hardly ever. <laughs> All right, let's go ahead and open with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we're thankful for the sacrifice that you made for us the plan of salvation. We pray that today you will send your Holy Spirit to guide us into truth. We pray that you'll be with the meetings and the people that have been invited. May the Holy Spirit touch their hearts again and remind them of their need to come to these meetings. Pray for the technology piece as well. Uh, we pray that uh, if the computers and all that don't work, that the rocks will speak out to whoever needs to hear the message. We're thankful for Brian. We pray that you will use him mightily and that hearts may be won to you. We pray. Amen. Well, lesson number two, a moment of destiny. Now, what is your destiny? Heaven. What is... Yes, that's, that's the, well, and we'll talk about that. There's only one way to reach that destiny. But the Bible says, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, right? What did God say to Adam and Eve at the, at the tree? If you eat of this, you will surely die. And then what does Satan tell us? And we've gone through this lesson studies before. He says, you won't really die. You're just going to live forever. forever. So really, the, the destiny of sin is death, isn't it? The wages of sin is death. And really, wages would be about the same as destiny, really, wouldn't it? Because you're destined to die if you live in sin. And has that role played out over the years? Since creation? Every day. Every day, yeah. The pile of dust just gets higher and higher on planet Earth. And so that is our destiny. But what about Jesus' destiny? You know, the title of the lesson study is A Moment of Destiny. And I just had to really look at that and see, well, what is he getting at? A moment of destiny. Yes. Hey, 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 Mike.
my son will have to die. Yeah. I mean, how profound is that? Would it have made any difference? Well, actually, you know, Mike, I think he did tell him that afterwards. When he when he described to them the sanctuary service and what would have to happen. No, I agree with that. I'm just yeah. at creation when he was, yeah. Did they really have a concept of death? <laughs> no, they really didn't, did they? So in Ephesians 1, 3 through 6, Mike, this, is, um, this will sort of answer that question. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundations of the world. Before the foundations of the world. So what does that tell you about whatever happens beyond that in regards to prophecy and the plan of salvation? That it was destined. It was destined for that to happen. Here Jesus says, Father, this is in John 17, 24, Father, I desire that they also whom ye gave me be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which you have given me, for you loved me before the foundation of the world. So what is he really saying there? He says, what are you really destined to be? Us, earth, human beings, we're destined to die. Look what he's praying for. The glory you have given me, for you loved me before the foundation of the world. 1 Peter 1.20, he indeed was foredained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. In Matthew 25.34 it says, Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. So destiny, you know, the whole plan of salvation, how God can win us back, his creation, that's what he was destined to do. And there's just a number of different texts that go into uh, the lamb without spot or blemish before the foundations of the world that that lamb was selected to do his work before the foundations of the world. And Ellen White describes that in The Desire of Ages where she talks about sin and the plan of salvation and how they agonized over that whole scenario of what to do with the sin problem. And it was a big thing for Jesus to do, to leave heaven and come to this earth as a man and sacrifice himself on the cross. In John 8, 37, just looking at this destiny, John 8, 37, and here it says, Eighteen thirty-seven. I missed that one line. Eighteen thirty-seven. He's speaking to Pilate, and Pilate says to him, "Are you a king then?" Jesus answered, "You say rightly that I am a king. For this cause I was born, and for this cause I have come into the world." that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. So what does he say there before again? That I was born for this reason, to do what I was going to do. And so some of the texts that we have is he says that I have come to give them life and to give it more abundantly. So if our destiny is death, what is Christ's destiny, this moment of destiny? is to give us life 
that gift of salvation. And so I really like this moment of desti destiny. So then what is the part that the prophets play in all of this? How does that work? What does God do as a warning for something that's, you know, earth-shattering that's going to happen? What does he do? Okay, so he does that. Do you have any examples of how that happened in the Old Testament? You know, so at the flood, right? So there was a warning. It was given to Noah, and Noah warned the people what was going to happen, and it was the destruction of this entire earth. I mean, that was fairly monumental. And then you think of the Passover in Egypt, the warnings that God was going to give to Egypt and to the children of Israel as to what was going to happen. Same thing. It was a big warning. And then how about John the Baptist? What did he do with John the Baptist? Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So that's a big warning. And then as we go down through time and we look at the three angels' message, in Revelation 14, is this a big warning for the end time people? It is, isn't it? Worship him who created the heavens and the earth and the sea and the fountains thereof. Babylon has fallen, has fallen. You know, these messages that he gave for us, this warning that is, it is what's coming down the pike. So... I like what uh, Pastor Finley had to say right at the end as he went through and described all of these things, this moment of destiny. And his last paragraph there is, thus now is the time to prepare. Does any of you sense that this world is a little chaotic? Oh, kind description. Kind description? Men will be lovers of pleasure more than lovers of me. Where do you see examples of that today? No sports. Okay. What's the biggest building in every town? Football stadium. Okay. What else? Gambling. Okay, so gambling could be one, but how about one really big one? Men, men will be lovers of pleasure more than lovers of me. What about entertainment media? Do you think that might be playing a role in distractions? How many people look at their TV guide more than they do the Bible? Do you think Satan uses these distractions to keep us away from what really is important for each and every one of us? and covers it up. And look what he's doing now. with what, what, hap what is happening in this world today as far as conservative news? It's suppressed, isn't it? It's pushed down. So a day before yesterday, a lady wanted to adopt a baby in Portland. And she put on her resume that she was a Christian. And she was told, because you're a Christian, you don't have the values sufficient enough to, to adopt this child. because you're a Christian. So are we starting to see religious persecution here in the United States? Although subtly? How about in other places of the world? How about in China? You know, they just accepted a whole bunch of refugees in Texas yesterday for, to escape religious persecution from China. Christian Chinese people. How about Afghanistan? What happens when you're um, part of the Taliban regime and you're in that country and you're a Christian? Yeah, I mean, your, your neck and your shoulders are no longer connected. I mean, it's terrible. But what's happening to the underground church in Afghanistan? It's growing by leaps and bounds. 
They just can't believe it. And this isn't from, this isn't um, just stuff from our Adventist literature. This is something that I just read from, anybody know McElhaney, the press secretary, President Trump's last press secretary? She wrote a book that just talked about serenity in, in uh, uncertain times, how to find serenity in Jesus Christ. And she has a whole chapter in her book on Afghanistan. And, you know, and she had, she's quite the investigator. You know, she has a, a degree in law from Harvard and trained at a number of different big institutions. So she's well known for being just a, a diehard uh, person for collecting data. And she has said that the growth in the underground church in Afghanistan is just boiling over. So we see the gospel being preached throughout the world, don't we? That's another one of the signs that we see. Um, it's unprecedented. In India, same thing. The gospel is being preached, and thousands and thousands are being baptized. Um, what else do we see? What other warnings? Um, there would be wars and rumors of wars, and pestilence, and, and disasters in diverse places. Have we seen all of those things? You know, and that's been happening for years and years and years. And I always, I always thought, well, yeah, but there were disasters at Pompeii, big disasters that were way back when, and they just weren't reported well because the news system wasn't like we have today. But then over the past 10 years, have you noticed a really disturbing trend in this end time? So in more frequency, uh huh. But I mean, more than that, what about the morality of the of this world? Some of the things that you see today don't even make common sense, right? They don't even make common sense, and yet we see these things. And I I want to be vague on purpose because I think I'm on the radio, and so you know it. Uh, there are just things that you see in the moral world that are, you know, when the Bible says good is considered evil and evil is considered good, and the lines are blurred so much between good and evil, and we see that today. So that takes us to Sunday's lessons. The eternal choices that we make are so important. So let's look at Revelation 14, 6. And to get into the heart of our lesson. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. So it's a, it's a wide group, isn't it? And we talked about that. That one of the things he says, and in Matthew 24, 14, um, it says, this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all of the world. This is the fulfillment of that prophecy, isn't it, that, that Jesus gave. And that's what's happening. And when did this all start? Do you guys know when the first angel's message came out? Uh -huh. 1843, when that message came out. And when, did, when was the Sabbath again looked at and, and, um, and reanalyzed after it emerged from the Dark Ages, had it been suppressed from the Dark Ages? And it was soon after that, wasn't it? Joseph Bates and uh, the whole Sabbath message came out. And so, you know, we can see that that emergence from the Dark Ages was so important. You know, the two witnesses, two witnesses that had been destroyed and then came back to life. And those are so important for each and every one of us. Um, but eternal choices that are made in Revelation, that final message. 
um, and we talked about destiny. Why is it important for us to make that choice? <laughs> what does Joshua say? Choose ye this day whom ye will serve. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So, why is it important for us to choose? What are we choosing? Depends where we're going to end up. <laughs> what did Jesus choose every day? Okay, so Rick says the Father's will. So, when he accepted 100% his Father's will, and that's the recommendation that, that Solomon gave us, right? Right? When you make decisions in your life, what you should, what you should do? Okay? So you should put him first, that he was, he's the one that should make the decisions in your life. Is that hard to do? To give him everything. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. So when you think about when you think about Jesus Christ as being perfect what did that mean? How can we be perfect in Christ by the eternal choices that we make? He makes us for her deficiency for her acts. Okay. Yeah, and, and it really, really depends on what your idea of perfection is, right? So if your idea of perfection is, is there's a certain point that you reach and you're done, right? You're done. We as Christians, are we ever going to be in that category? Are we going to be learning things forever and ever and ever and ever and ever? What is perfect submission to God's will. Isn't that what Jesus did? Isn't that what he showed us how to do? And as we walk with God, can we be perfect and different as we go along the path because we are in perfect submission to God's will? So when Ellen White says that sanctification is the work of a lifetime, um, that's, a, that's the process of growing. And, and she doesn't say this lifetime. That growing, as you point out, is a work of uh, forever that goes on in our lives, right? As we continue to become more like Christ. You know, we never reach the goal. We never reach uh, the climax. Let's say you're an angel and you're in heaven and you've made the choice to stay in heaven. But, or, or a person in another world, but before the cross, there was some doubt, some question as to whether God's perfect law, perfect government was, was right. Was Satan right? If they had that doubt, would they be perfect? Okay. So it was because they were they chose to believe God. So what do you call that living by faith? Mm -hmm. Is that exactly what happened in Christ? Mm -hmm. I mean, because faith is only faith of the Son of Jesus. Mm -hmm. My understanding is by the time you get to heaven, there will be no more faith needed. Because what, like Paul says, faith is, comes from the unseen. Once you've seen it, there is no need for faith anymore. So let's say. Let's say I tell you that God has always existed. Well, so, you know, I mean, that would just be, that would just be my thought. So if, if God always existed, so there was no beginning, how do you not wrap that up in your brain without saying that's a faith issue? And how would that ever change? 
that's right. There's, well, we, ne- we will never see everything, right? We will never see everything. So there will always be need for faith. Even if throughout eternity, we will not see all that God is. And yeah, but it says here, because there's things of the substance of things hoped for and evidence of the things not seen. So, uh, going with what you're just saying, and that would have, then I would have to assume that if we're going to learn for eternity, then there's something that we all were going to be seeing is the significance of what Christ has done for eternity. But I do find, I do find this interesting, the verse that you just read. Listen to this. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them the dwell on earth. So he's sending the angels to preach unto them the everlasting gospel on earth. And yet Paul, Paul says this, Romans 10, How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they that should believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent, as it is written? And I'm sitting here going, everything that the angels have come to preach, they experienced in heaven. You know, that's a whole nother subject that just this last week, Darlene and I were talking about the angels. And just imagine if the angels wrote a book and said, okay, this is my experience in heaven. This is what I saw. And there was war in heaven. And, you know, Lucifer and his angels. Revelation 12, the same thing we talked about earlier. We saw that happen. They had the doubt. Then they saw the whole plan of salvation played out all the way to the cross. And they saw what Satan would do to Jesus. And it it was bad what they did to him. I mean, it was really bad. So they're there watching the whole thing. In fact, they turn their heads because it was such a brutal, violent event that happened to their commander. And this is somebody they loved. This is somebody that they endeared. And to think about, here he's been beaten twice with the cat of nine tails. I mean, and that's violent. I mean, and with the fury of Satan behind it, he received all those lashes. And a lot of times that would rip your abdomen open and people would die just from having that done. So he's been whipped by this thing. Now he has to carry the cross outside of Jerusalem and he can't do it. And who stepped up to help him? One of his disciples? One of the people that loved him? Did anybody step up to the plate and say, yes, I'm willing to help him? Nobody helped him. And you know, and they were guaranteed that if, if Jesus was delivered that from the Pharisees and the Sadducees that they wouldn't interfere with any of the other uh, disciples of Jesus. They just wanted Jesus. So they were there. They were in the crowd. They saw what happened. But did any of them even offer to help? Not one. So Joseph of Arimathea, he felt bad about the whole thing and looked and stood there, and he was selected. Well, it seems to me that the, the example of the thief on the cross is a prime example of choosing Christ and accepting his perfection at that moment because you make the right choice. Yeah. I mean, that is a good one. And he made it. He knew that he was a sinner. And he knew that this was an innocent man. Yeah. Yeah. Are there others around the cross that did the same thing? About the centurion. Surely this must be the Son of God. And then afterwards, you can imagine, you can read the account in the Desire of Ages. It's the chapter called Calvary. And it's phenomenal. It's one we should read every, 
well, Ellen White says we should contemplate on the life of Christ every day, but when you look and read that account, it, uh, it's shocking. It's really shocking. The king of the universe, one that, and what really hurt him the most, he really didn't really feel the pain of the cross being dropped into that hole and his feet and hands nailed to the cross. What was it that he felt? And, you know, and when he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And it was while he was being nailed to the cross. And some expositors say that he said this over and over again. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. You know, it's just uh, pleading with God to to uh, rescue these people. That's just love that we can't imagine. Love that we can't imagine. And then when he cried out those words, it is finished. And then what happened to the whole world? There was an earthquake. There was a cloud that surrounded the, the cross and hid him from the cross and lightning that came out from that cloud around the cross. And people feared for their lives. They were hugging the ground because they feared so much for their lives. What a moment. What a moment. That was Friday night. But Sunday's coming, like one preacher says. <laughs> Sunday's coming. So that choice that we make is so important. So how does God shape our characters? What means does he use for us to grow in grace? What can we do to more fully allow the Holy Spirit to transform us to be more like Jesus? So how do we do that? Choose ye this dame whom ye will serve. That's an everyday choice. Yeah. How do you search the Lord with all your heart? Or to trust the Lord with all your heart? This is something Solomon said. Did Solomon trust the Lord with all of his heart? Or was this something that he just realized as he went through life and made lots of mistakes? We're all in that category, aren't we? But to trust the Lord with all your heart and lean not upon your own understanding. Um, what else does Paul say that we should do when we are encountered with things that are before us? To look at those things that are good, right? That are holy, that are just. And to think on these things. Those things that are righteous, good, and holy. And to eliminate everything else, right, in our lives. You either choose to participate in these things that turn you away from God, or you move in that direction called God called the light, and you stay within the light. You turn away from darkness. So those are the choices that we can make, the eternal choices. What? That we can't do it?
I think that's true. I think it's, but I think it's natural fruit. It's natural fruit that occurs. You know, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. Those things that you have. And, but what I'm getting at is, is that, you know, choose ye this dame who you will serve. You're confronted with something. Right? There's a choice you have to make. Either turn right or turn left. And the Holy Spirit is there saying, Dennis, I think you got to turn right. And then you think of ten reasons why you should turn left. Right? The Holy Spirit says, like, don't do it. Don't, don't do it. Make that right choice. And learning to listen to that voice I think is what's really important. And in order to do that, What's the first commandment? Thou shalt have no other gods before me. And what happens if you have a God before him? Is that what you're going to talk about? Is that what you're going to focus on? Is your God? Let's say your God is football, sports. It's not, it's not bad to talk about that, but what if it's the only thing you ever talk about? You know, or whatever, whatever it happens to be. Not that it's bad inherently, but if it's your God, then you're going to talk about it. If God's your God, really your God, and you have that relationship with him, the fruits that are going to come out of that are wanting to share with everybody. I mean, think about it as the time of the end comes down. How, um, how uh, uh, sure is your money right now. You know, the dollar is being devaluated incredibly. Anybody gone shopping lately and bought something? You know, something that four months ago I bought for $11 was a sprinkler, Hunter sprinklers. So I bought one yesterday because I had one break. It was $25. So it's doubled in price. And that's everything is like that. Um, when you go to the, the market, even a year ago, you thought, wow, I mean, $60 worth of groceries, that didn't go very far. Well, now that's $120 worth of groceries. So your money's not sure. What about your pension plan that you have? Do you see that being wiped out? You do, don't you? And all, all of that aside, let's say you have a billion dollars and your name is Steve Jobs, and you find out that you have pancreatic cancer, what's all that money going to do for you? Nothing. So when you put it all into perspective and you see the uncertainty we have in this world today, with the signs that Jesus tells us in Matthew 24 and in Revelation that are right here before us, and you can see that pretty soon everything you hold dear is going to be destroyed in fire. And you look across and you look at your neighbor's house and you say, wow, I don't think we passed that around. We didn't. Sorry about that. And you look at your neighbor's house and they're super friendly and super nice, but you never shared the love of Jesus with them like Mike said. How do you feel when that time comes when they say, why didn't you share that with me? I mean, you lived right next to me. If you were really a good neighbor, that's, that's what you would have done. Right? The love of God. That transforms you. And, Mike, I think that's what makes you into a creature that's willing to preach and talk about Jesus Christ. Look what Jesus has done for me. You know, why are we fearful to do that? Why are we fearful to share the meetings we have coming up with people that are around us? Why is it? You think you might look stupid or they'll, they'll think you're... Okay. So you're not going to... Basically, you're not going to fit in to their crowd, right? And, and why is that... Why does not that not make sense? I mean, you want to fit in, but also you recognize that the need, the urgency of Christ coming soon and what it means to that person if you don't share and if you were their only opportunity to give it and you failed to do so. <coughs> ah, I mean, you're looking at them but you can't see God. 
And it's just like sometimes you're willing to say things about your wife sometimes that somebody else makes them feel better but makes your wife feel horrible. And see, now God makes it even easier for you because with all of this stuff going on in this world, people are afraid. People are asking questions. They're saying, you know, wow. I mean, I like Mark Finley's little story. He talked about Teeny, his wife. They were getting their son's haircut. And um, she goes, Mark, you got to go get your haircut. And uh, he goes, why? Well, my hair looks pretty good. I don't need a haircut. She goes, no. The, uh, the um, barber is interested in Revelation and wants you to, I want you to go because he's interested in Revelation. And so evidently there was a man waiting to get his hair cut and he was reading the paper and saying, wow, I mean, this is just bad news in here. It's scary, just reading the news. And, um, and the barber said, well, you should read Revelation. If you want to get scared, you should just read Revelation. And so Teeny said, Mark, you've got to go set him straight. You've got to go set him straight. So he went and sat down, and he wasn't quite sure how he was going to address the guy. So he just picked up the paper, and he said, wow, everything in the news is sure scary. <laughs> and the guy took the bait and said, yeah, but you should, you should see what, uh, what's written in Revelation if you want to be scared. And so then he shared the whole plan of salvation and how Jesus is the center focus of Revelation. You know, in our first chapter, what was the first chapter in our lesson study? Jesus wins. So the whole story of Revelation tells us how Jesus wins. And so, I mean, that's what really gives us the fervor to share with others, is that Jesus wins. Yeah, the earth's falling apart, but Jesus wins. Guys, ever seen Anglican preachers from the Anglican faith? So they come in this big regal robe, and they have a hat that's like, and they have a cross that's huge on their chest, and they have a beard that hangs down to their knees. So I mean, they look like a, a like an ancient prophet. So it's kind of interesting. So I have a patient like that, and he's a really good friend. We've gotten to know each other, and he's very intelligent, very intelligent. So right now they're celebrating Easter, and they do it differently than they do the Catholic Church or other churches. They're, they're very unique. And so I mentioned that we were having evangelistic series at our church. And, you know, we were going to talk about prophecy. Huh? You didn't call it an evangelistic series. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder what people think. Because that's what I've always called them. Yeah, well, that's how I've always called them, too or prophecy. But anyway, so I'm talking to him about it, and he, said, and he said, you know, I said, I'm a Seventh-day Adventist, and, you know, I think these will be really good. And so he looked at me, and he said, my sister is a Seventh-day Adventist. She's 20 years older than I am. She's passed away. But yeah, my sister was an Adventist. And so she says, I, he says, I know all that, all the message that you have. He says, well, come on out.
So we had, um, we're, Darlene and I are raking leaves, and uh, we have two oak trees in our front yard, and why in the world we ever planted them there was terrible, because they drop 10,000 acorns every year, and you know, Darlene's very fastidious out there picking them up, because they grow shoots, and you know, hard to walk on, all that kind of stuff. And then they drop a lot of leaves, and so we're raking leaves, and I looked at her and I said, you know what, we need to cut those trees down. <laughs> So, and they're big, beautiful trees. So anyway, so uh, I called the guy and the bid was pretty high and I was at work and Steve Mack, he goes, uh, well, um, I know a guy that cut trees for me, he was pretty good. And so, uh, and so I called him and, uh, and then I said, you know, but one thing, we just don't want you working on Saturday. And he goes, Sabbath. And I says, oh, so you know about the Sabbath? He goes, oh, yeah. He goes, I used to be a, I used to, well, he says, I'm a Seventh-day Adventist, but I haven't been to church in a long time. And I said, oh, really? I said, well, there's an evangelistic series coming at our church. And he said, uh, do you think Jesus is coming soon? And I said, yes, I do. And he goes, I do, too. I do, too. I really do. And he says, why do you think that? And so I told him, and. And he says, well, I need the information of when to be there. And so anyway, so he came out, did a perfect job. Trees came down perfect, didn't wipe out our house or anything. Did he? Yeah. Same guy? So we called him yesterday and said, hey, you remember the meetings? Yep, I'm going to be there. So he'll be there uh, tonight. Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, statistically, I mean, I'm, I'm sure, Brian, you know statistics on how many um, actually come, the percentage. But you know it's going to be a small percentage. You know it's not going to be every one that you, you give one to, they're going to show up. But think about logistics. Let's say each, each gave out 20. You have 300 members, and it's a personal invitation when you hand that to them. You say, hey, these are really good. What I told my neighbor was, was that I went up and gave him one, and I said, you know, this, we live in the end times, and I want you to know that I really care for you and your family, and this is really important to me, and I want to share that with you. And then I gave him that thing. And so, you know, and, and he may, he's a great neighbor. And, uh, you know, I'd just given him that piece hopefully it will stimulate him to come. But again, it's just going to be a small percentage, but if each one of us gave 20 out, which wouldn't be that hard to do, when you look at the numbers, and these are per personal invitations, um, even if you got 3%, because I want to be conservative.
Yeah, we hope that. But I think what my point was, Mike, is, is that when we add that personal touch, mm -hmm. those numbers are going to go up. And that's what's really important to me. And that's something that maybe I, I was lacking on beforehand, you know, the urgency of the call and saying how important it is to you. And, you know, the whole thing about being afraid to, to do it and why is because you don't fit in. Well, you've got to drop that mindset and say, this is for your life. You know, as a physician, I can help you with your physical things, maybe. Um, I can help you with lifestyle change. But what about the spiritual aspect and the healing from there? I mean, how many people that Jesus healed did they die from their, you know, physically? They did. I mean, a lot of them spiritually will be in the kingdom because they accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior. But if I don't offer that to my patient, I've just cut off one whole part of their healing process. Yeah. And so some seeds don't sprout till later. So it might build on something that the seed laid around that jogs their memory of the scar. Mm -hmm. But everyone is a seed that you're planting. Right. And that was the last part of the lesson, which we're never going to get to. <laughs> yes. It shakes their brain. So when they open up the, the mailbox and see the brochure, which is great, but nobody prompted it, nobody triggered their brain. You know, and one of the things, just funny, you, you mentioned that, a great controversy. Um, <laughs> I don't know what you would do with this situation. I'll tell you what I did. So anyway, um, she says, hey, I got that book, The Great Controversy. And I started it. And it's tough to read but I'm going to go through it because it's really good. And then she said, are you reading the book that I told you to read if I got the great controversy? And I had to say, well, remind me what that book was again. <laughs> so anyway, so I looked it up and uh, right in front of her, and it's about some guy that is shaky. I mean, just really shaky. So anyway, so, so I bought the book in front of her, and I said, you know, I... I will read this. I will read your book. And it's, it's totally off the wall. But uh, anyway, but she has a great controversy now. So, yes. Oh, okay. So you can, can you say ding dong for us real quick? Okay, perfect, perfect. Is that the first one or the second one? Oh, okay. All right, very good. All right. Boy, we barely got through the lesson. But uh, for all of you, we do live in an age of uncertainty. We do live in times where uh, people are afraid, and, and uh, even among us. And what can we do? And we need to look to Jesus. We need to look to Jesus. That's our only way. And to get to know him, to get to know him, we only have a few things that do it. It's the testimony of other people and what they have done in their lives. That means you share that with others. That's infectious. They want those things. They want that peace. And they notice that, you know, people that know Jesus, there is an air about them. Do you, have you ever seen that? They don't seem to be afraid of anything, right? Because they have hope. And so translating that to others is just so important. But how do we get that hope? How do we feed on that hope? And that is as we read God's word and we study God's word and we see the character of Jesus and what he's like. He's the antithesis of what Satan says. He comes to this world as the son of man. And he identifies himself as the son of man. 
and we didn't get to this part of the lesson, but it's so important because he will continue to identify himself as the son of man throughout the ages. He has chosen to keep those marks of the crucifixion on him each and every day to remind us of the penalty of the, of the horribleness of sin. He will be the only one, and he will always be a son of man. And you know, I mean, I can just imagine, I can just imagine meeting him and him saying, hi, Dennis. How are you? You know, and he's done that in the past. I mean, Zacchaeus, you come down for I'm going to your house today. He knows each and every one of us intimately with a love that you can't fathom. And to get to know him is the most important thing that you can do in your life. So let's close with prayer. Father in heaven, we're thankful for the plan of salvation. You made up this plan before we were even born. And we know that you know us by name and you have known us by name. And we pray that each one of us will make that choice to choose you, to follow you, that we may be perfected by following the will of the Father just as you followed the will of the Father. We thank you, Lord, we pray. Amen.